Father, we ask that you would do that tonight. Lord, you come again by the power of your Spirit. Lord, give us this day our daily bread, Lord, that which would again be the very bread of heaven. Lord, as we bring this word to you, we ask, Lord, that you'd breathe upon it. Father, make it alive, make it uh, living, make it active. Father, let it accomplish, Lord, that which you have purposed tonight. Father, have your way again in each and every life, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to uh, shift gears tonight a little bit and uh, talk to you about the purpose of God. The purpose of God. I want you to imagine that when you came in at the front door, that one of the ushers, one of the greeters, handed you, each of you, a plastic bag. And in that plastic bag, there was a uh, jigsaw puzzle. Some of you got a small jigsaw puzzle, some of you got a medium-sized one, some of you got a big one, some of you got a huge one. And uh, you are now asked to put that jigsaw puzzle together. And you reach into that bag and you pull out a little red piece, those funny shaped pieces, and you look at it and you think, I would know where this fits in and I would know what that is if I had the cover of the box. But I don't have the cover of the box, all I've got is these unrelated little pieces. I don't know if this is a seascape, a landscape, a still life, a city life. I don't know if it's uh, an individual when it's all put together. I don't have any idea what this jigsaw looks like because I do not have the cover of the box. I think that uh, describes many believers. Your jigsaw puzzle varies depending how long you've been going to church or how long you've been born again. This is what happens, you get saved, you come to church, the speaker is speaking about maybe the family, doing a little series on the family, and so by the end of the week you have all sorts of little pieces about the family. You go the next week and there is somebody that tackles the book of Romans, and so you have some pieces about the book of Romans. You go the following week and there is a guest speaker, he's talking about prayer, and you have a few other pieces of the jigsaw. You go the next week, again, there's another guest speaker and he's talking about something else, and so again, you've got other aspects. And over the years, you have all these unrelated facts and figures from the Word of God. And yet nobody has ever put the jigsaw puzzle together for you. And you say, well, where does the family fit in with prayer, and where does prayer fit in with this and that and so on? What does it look like when it's all put together? Well, we are going to put it together tonight. Now, I won't put every last piece in place, but I will give you an understanding of what it's all about. Because one of the great tragedies, at least to me, is that people go to church and they have no understanding as to what the purpose of God is. If I said to you that I belong to the local golf club <clears throat> where I live, you would assume that I enjoy playing golf. If I said I belong to the local vintage car club, you would assume that I have an old vintage car. I don't play golf and I don't have a vintage car. But uh, if I said to you that I belong to the local tennis club, you would assume I enjoy playing tennis. If I said I belong to the local hunting club, you would assume I enjoy hunting. If I said I belong to the local chess club, you would assume I enjoy the game of chess. If I said I belong to the local church club, can anybody fill in the blank? Does something just come to mind immediately? Because let's face it, you belong to this club. You may meet in a different clubhouse. Some of you are visitors to this particular clubhouse. But uh, nevertheless, you go to a clubhouse. Can you tell me what that club is all about? Can you define what that club is all about. After all, you go, you sing club songs, you turn around occasionally and greet uh, club members, you pay your club fees. <clears throat> There's a box at the back in case you need to. Uh, and uh, occasionally we have uh, club meals together where we get together and enjoy a meal. But can you define what the club is all about? Now, if I said to you that, uh, let's say, some non-religious night, like a Tuesday night, let's say that you saw me somewhere in Dungannon going up a flight of steps, and maybe three weeks in a row you see me on a Tuesday night going up a flight of steps, 
to uh, some sort of a room, and you stop me and you question me and you say, uh, you know, the last three weeks I happen to be driving by there on Main Street and I've noticed you're going up to some room somewhere up there in the top of that building and I was just wondering, you know, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm, uh, I'm going to a club. And you say uh, to me, well, what sort of a club is it? And I say, well, I really don't know. My parents started taking me to that club when I was just a little child. I know a lot of the club members, they're wonderful people. We have various uh, departments for various age groups. We sing club songs. We have some wonderful time. Yeah, but what, what, what's the club all about? I mean, why did you go? I, I, I guess tradition. My parents started taking me. I've been going ever since. Now, you would look at me, and uh, I would look at you, and you'd say, you're crazy. You, you mean you go on a regular basis to this place every Tuesday night without failure, and you don't have a clue what it's all about? You see, God has a purpose, and we need to understand, because the, my Bible tells me, and yours does too, that we have been called to be laborers together with Him. In other words, God is doing something. And we have been invited to participate, and he needs our help. We are laborers together with him. And so we need to understand, again, the purpose of God. One of my favorite verses is in Acts uh, chapter 13, verse 36, where it says, David served the purpose of God in his generation, and afterwards he died or he slept. In other words, David, King David, knew what God was doing in his particular day and age, and he chose to align himself with the purpose of God, and he served the purpose of God all of his life. And then he died. Now, that should not be said of uh, David only. That should be said of your life and my life, that you serve the purpose of God. We are not responsible for the past generation because we did not live then. We're not responsible for the next generation apart from trying to raise our children in a godly way, but we are responsible for our generation. And the Bible says that God has saved us and He has called us with a holy calling. If I asked you how many of you are saved, I dare say 99% of you would put up your hand tonight. If I said how many of you are called, possibly a few of you would sort of hesitate and look around and think it was some sort of a trick question. Well, the Bible says you, He has not only saved you, He has called you. In other words, if you are saved, you're called. And if you are called, you're called with a holy calling. Every single one of us has a calling. And we need to understand again what that calling is. And so the Bible is full of verses about the purpose of God. Possibly the one that you know the best is Romans 8 and verse 28, all things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are called according to His purpose. Hebrews chapter 6 talks about the unchangeableness of God's purpose. In other words, God's purpose has never changed. Somebody said many years ago that the purpose of God never changes, but the instruments do. Let's say that my purpose for the next six months is to build myself a house. And in the process of building that house, I will use a variety of instruments. I'll use a hammer and a saw and so on and so forth. And let's say I'm using a hammer. That's my instrument of choice for this particular task. And the shaft of that hammer breaks. I am going to discard that hammer and uh, buy a new one because that hammer is no longer serviceable. But my purpose remains the same. And so over the years... God has to raise up new instruments. The reason being, we don't live forever. So every generation, God looks for participants, if you like, that will join with Him in His purpose. Another reason that God has to raise up new instruments is because some instruments do not respond to the call of God. One of the most frightening verses, I think, in the Bible is in the book of Revelation, where it warns us about somebody taking our crown. In other words, we will get to heaven one day, and I hope this is not true of you or me, but it will be true of some, and they will see somebody there with a reward, a crown, and God will say to them, that's the crown you could have had. I called you to go to Africa, but you never went. You went into business instead. And so I had to call this sister, and she is now wearing the reward that you could have had. Beware, lest any man take your crown. 
And so it's a very serious thing because, again, we are serving the King of all kings. It is the greatest privilege that we have, the greatest calling that we have, is to work and labor with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God has a purpose. Now, one of the tragedies, again, in the house of God is that we can become so engrossed in the subject matter of Christianity that we lose sight of the object. If I can introduce to you an imaginary friend, and I'll call this man Dr. Brown, and Dr. Brown is the world's leading authority on medicine. Dr. Brown is 99 years of age. Dr. Brown knows everything there is about the human body. In fact, Dr. Brown is listed in the world, uh, the Guinness Book of World Records. Good Irish book. <clears throat> and uh, he is known because he is an expert in every branch of medicine. You can ask him about the brain, and he can tell you everything about the brain. You can ask him about the ears, he can tell you everything about how the ears function. He can tell you how the eyes function, and every facet of the body. And you say to Dr. Brown, Dr. Brown, I understand you're the world's leading authority on medicine. He says, yes, sir, that's right. And I say, have you uh, ever performed open heart surgery? And he says, no, sir. I said, have you ever fitted somebody with a hearing aid? I understand you know all about the hearing. He says, no, sir. Have you ever done a transplant of any kind? He says, no, sir. I say, have you ever taken out somebody's appendix? He says, no, sir. I say, have you ever removed anybody's tonsils? He says, no, sir. I said, have you ever set a broken bone? He says, no, sir. Have you ever delivered a baby? No, sir. I said, have you ever put on a Band-Aid or a bandage? He says, no, sir. You see, he's become so engrossed in the subject matter of medicine, he's lost sight of the object. And it's so easy, isn't it, to come to meetings like this and conferences like this and fill our notebooks full of notes and we've got all the answers. We are the world's leading authority when it comes to understanding this book. We can tell you who the Antichrist is, how many wives he's going to have or whatever, and, you know, where he's going to, you know, be born and die and all the things. You know, we can wax eloquent about all these things. And then you say to that person, listen, have you ever led anybody to Christ? No, sir. Have you ever taught a Sunday school class? No, sir. Have you ever testified publicly? No, sir. Have you ever passed out a tract on the street? No, sir. Have you ever sung in the choir? No, sir. Ever passed out a bulletin as people came in at the church? No, sir. You see, we get so engrossed in the subject matter, we lose sight of the object. We become sort of professional Christians. And God is saying, listen, I need laborers, laborers that will work with me. Now, obviously, God's original purpose was to have a vast family of sons and daughters, all in His likeness and all in His image. After all, when He created man, Adam and Eve, He said, I want you to be fruitful and I want you to fill the earth. He wasn't just talking about filling the earth with people. He was talking about filling the earth because there was no sin at that time, filling the earth with His image, His glory. The glory of God is the nature of God, the character of God. Man was made in the image of God, and he had the glory of God. And yet when he sinned, he came short of the glory of God. But his original plan was to multiply and have a vast family of sons and daughters, all with a striking resemblance to God. His nature, His character, His being. That was God's original plan. Of course, the enemy came in, thwarted that plan, and got man to believe that uh, he, uh, he was better off again doing his own thing. We talked briefly about that the other night. And so God begins again and uh, in the book of Genesis, and we are going to look at a number of scriptures, so bear with me. I'll be uh, going somewhat fast, so you can uh, just listen. But in Genesis chapter 12, God solicits, if you like, the help of a man by the name of Abraham. Verse 1, And the Lord said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show you. I, am, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I'll make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. 
Now, God is looking for a people here. God is forming a company of people. And Abraham becomes the father of this new company of people, a people that God intended would work with him to accomplish his goal, his desire. And he sums it all up there. He says, not only will I bless you, Abraham, and so on, but he says, through you, all the families or all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And then we go over into Genesis chapter 18. And verse 17, and the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I shall do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and a mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So once again, God reiterates to this man of God, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed because of you. Then we go over into Genesis chapter 22. And verse 16, and he said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice." Now, we find that one of the keys to God's purpose being fulfilled is obedience. He says, listen, I can carry out my purpose through you, Abraham, because you will obey me. Let's suppose, for instance, that my purpose is that everybody sees my pen. This is actually an Irish pen, believe it or not. I bought it on eBay in America, made in uh, Belfast. But anyway... So let's suppose that uh, everybody is to touch my pen. That's my purpose. And I uh, give my pen to Pastor Bertie, and he looks at it, and he says, that's a nice pen. He passes it to Pat, and uh, Pat looks at it and says, yes, that's a nice pen. Passes it to uh, my wife, Nancy, and Nancy looks at it and says, no, that's a nice pen. And she passes it to the next uh, person, and that person says, I've always wanted one of those. Now, my purpose has been thwarted. You did not get to touch what was my purpose. I wanted everybody to see this pen. But because of somebody's disobedience, my purpose was thwarted. And so God said to Abraham, because you've obeyed me, this will take place. Now, Abraham had a son by the name of Isaac. And if we go into Genesis chapter 26 and verse 4, he says to Isaac, and I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. We then go to the life of Jacob in chapter 28 and verse 14. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Notice now, God is reiterating over and over and over and over again His purpose to these three men, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Bible refers to Abraham as the father of all those that believe. Not the ultimate father, obviously, that's God. But Abraham is the father of all those that believe. And then Abraham had Isaac as his son, Isaac had Jacob, and those three individuals throughout the Word of God are called the fathers. Not father, that's Abraham, but fathers. In other words, God is going to use these three men to give birth to a nation. Jacob, of course, had 12 sons, and those 12 sons became the 12 tribes that made up the nation of Israel. And so God is forming now a brand new nation. And in that nation, he is putting, if you like, his spiritual DNA. And he says, the purpose of this particular nation that I'm forming is that through this nation, all the nations of the earth are going to be impacted. They're going to be blessed. Now, when we talk about blessing, I don't know, I can't remember uh, the culture here in Ireland, but certainly in America, if you sneeze, somebody will turn around and immediately say, God bless you. I don't, do you do that here? Okay. Uh, you know, and so we use the word blessing in a variety of ways, don't we? And, uh, but let's look at the way God intended this word blessing 
as he spoke to Abraham in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. Let me read that again. And the scriptures foreseeing, in other words, God was looking down the years uh, to come, and he said that he would justify the heathen through faith. He preached the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thy seed shall all the nations be blessed. And so the way God defines blessing is, blessing is, the ultimate blessing is, the blessing of salvation. The blessing of justification. That you and I who were heathen, in the sense of being sinners, were justified by the grace and the mercy and the blood of the Lamb. That is the ultimate blessing. Let me prove that to you one more time in the book of uh, uh, Acts. Acts chapter 3. And verse 25 and verse 26, you are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, in thy seed shall all the kindreds or all the nations of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God has raised up his son Jesus, and he sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your iniquities or from his iniquities. Notice he blessed us by turning us from our iniquities. The greatest blessing is the blessing of salvation. And so way back in the old covenant, God was preaching the gospel, Paul says. Now we think of the gospel only in the New Testament sense. But it was the good news that through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That is why I am raising you up as a nation, God says. Now I want to look very quickly at a number of verses because obviously God's intention for Israel was they were to be a great missionary nation. That was God's purpose. In fact, that was really God's sole purpose. G. Campbell Morgan has a wonderful saying about the nation of Israel, and he summarizes the saying this way. (coughs) He said, it was not the selection of a pet, but the creation of a pattern. In other words, when God chose Israel, it was not the selection of a pet, but the creation of a pattern. Now, a lot of people think that Israel is uh, God's little pet. In other words, if I'm God and you represent all the nations of the earth, you've got Ireland here and England and Scotland and Wales and France and Germany and, you know, all the nations of the earth are represented. And my brother here on on the uh, second or third row, he represents Israel and I represent God. And uh, I just lavish all my love upon this brother and everybody in the class, so to speak, knows that he's the teacher's pet and he can do no wrong. And he gets by with things that nobody else can get by with, and everybody's sort of jealous, but the the news spreads. He's the teacher's pet. No, God is no respecter of persons. God raised up Israel as a pattern. And it was through that pattern that they were to be an example to all the nations of the earth. And so I want to look at just a few scriptures in Psalm 67 that will give you a little indication There were always, let me put it this way, there was always a remnant all the way through Israel's history that understood the mind of God pertaining to their nation. And David, of course, was one of those. And in Psalm 67, he begins, God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause your face to shine upon us that thy way may be known upon the earth, thy saving health among all nations. In other words, he says, God, if you bless us, then all the nations of the earth will see it, and your saving health will be among all nations. Verse 6, then the earth yielded her increase, and God, even our God, has blessed us. God has blessed us, my translation says, that all the ends of the earth may fear him. In other words, David is saying, God, bless us, because if you bless us, the nations are going to take notice. And that was God's intention. In other words, the nations were to look on at this little tiny nation. It was uh, pretty small in comparison to many of the nations. But God said to that nation, and this was all contingent upon their obedience, as long as they were obedient, they would never lose a battle. 
And the other nations would look on and say, we don't get it. You're a tiny little nation, but you've gone up against huge nations, and you've won, you've conquered. We don't understand why your crops never fail. You always have rain in its season. You always have an abundance harvest. We don't understand why you don't have the same divorce rate that we do. We don't understand why you don't have the same rebellion among the children that we have amongst our tribes and nations. We don't understand, again, why you don't get the same diseases that we get, and so on. And that was what Israel was to be. As long as they were obedient, God was going to bless them. But it was all for one reason, so the nations would look on and see the contrast. They were to be the light in the midst of the darkness, the heathen darkness round about them. And the nations would look on and say, listen, is there any chance that we could join you? What is it about you people? And Israel was really supposed to respond and say, you know, we're really no different than you are. But our God is different than your God. We serve the God of all gods, the King of all kings. We serve the creator of heaven and earth. We serve the God that made the rain and the snow and so on. We serve the God that causes the sun to rise and set. Our God is the great God. Our God can keep us from disease. Our God can uh, bless us. And God has given us these wonderful rules to live by, these laws. And as long as we walk in obedience to those things, we are blessed. Now, that was the way it was supposed to work. Let me look at another scripture in Isaiah, chapter 49. And verse 3, he said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Other translations say, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will show my glory. But notice, what is a servant? A servant is one who knows what his responsibility is. His responsibility is, I have a master, and I am here to serve my master's interest. God says to Israel, You are a servant, I am the master. And I want to demonstrate through you my glory, my nature, my character, and so on. Verse 6, and he said, Is it a light thing that thou uh, shouldest be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also give thee as a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. Again, God says, is it too light a thing that you should be my servant? Are you despising, if you like, the calling to which I've called you? You're my servant. You're a servant to the King of kings, to the creator of the universe. And it is my job to make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Now, God is trying again to get the attention of Israel and to show them why he raised them up. In uh, Second Chronicles, and this is one that has challenged me many, many times, there is a, a portion of Scripture here you are familiar with, Second Chronicles chapter 6. <clears throat> Solomon has uh, established the house of God, the temple, this uh, elaborate building that has so much gold and uh, so on, this very beautiful, magnificent temple for God. Remember, it was David's intention to build God a house that was sort of worthy of him. And God says, David, you can't build me a house. You're a man of war, but your son will build me a house. And so the day comes when Solomon has all the preparation basically done for him. David set things in motion, and he has put the house of God together, the, the temple of God, this magnificent building. And this is the opening day. And he is beginning to pray for the very first time in what we would call the house of God. Let me pick up part of that prayer, verse 32, because this is one of the few times where you really have insight into the understanding and the revelation of Solomon. Solomon, as you know, had great revelation given him by God, great wisdom given him by God. Ultimately, he went astray. But here he is really at the sort of the pinnacle of his spiritual understanding and revelation. And he's opening this uh, house of God, and he is praying. And part of his prayer, verse 32, moreover, concerning the stranger, or that word is also the foreigner, who is not of thy people Israel, but is come from a far country for thy great namesake and the mighty hand and your outstretched arm. And he comes and he prays in this house. Now, 
let me explain what Solomon is saying here. He's saying, God, something is going to happen in this house. Your glory is going to descend in this house. And when your glory comes, when you come and you begin to manifest yourself in the house of God where the presence of God is, it's going to be noised abroad about your power, your greatness. Notice the way he puts it, your mighty hand, your outstretched arm. And as a result, people are going to come to this house to pray. And so he says, when they do, verse 33, then hear thou from heaven your dwelling place and do according to all that the foreigner, the stranger, calleth to thee for, that all the people of the earth may know thy name and fear thee, as doeth thy people Israel, and that thou mayest uh, be known that this house which I have built is called by thy name. So Solomon is saying, God, when your glory fills this house, people are going to come from nations round about. Let me begin, if I can, just to put it into more tangible understanding. Let's say there is a couple, maybe a hundred miles away in another nation, and they have given birth to a little baby that has got all sorts of maladies, all sorts of uh, problems, and uh, like any parents, they are concerned about the fact that their baby has got all of these problems, and so they go to their idol at the end of their garden, and they take their bowl of meal or rice or whatever, and they bow down to their idol, and they cry out to their idol to heal their baby, and nothing happens. And they go the next day, and the next day, and then they start going twice a day. And the months go by, maybe six months goes by, and there's no sign of any change. And then somebody comes to that little town where this couple lives, and they begin talking about the fact, do you know about the God of Israel? And they say, well, how is their God different than our gods? We've got gods, look, I've got my God right there. And they say, oh no, the Israelites believe that their God is the real God, the true God, the God that created the heavens and the earth. He's the God that says, call unto me and I'll answer. He's the God that they claim that says, there's nothing too hard for me. In fact, they claim that their house where their God resides is a house that is available, a house of prayer for all nations. And the man looks at his wife and he says, honey, what if that's true? What if their God really is who he says he is? What if there is a bigger God than our God? What if there is a real powerful God, a God that created the heavens and the earth? It's worth going, isn't it? She says, yes, it is. And so they pack up their belongings, and they make the journey 50 or 100 miles, two or three or four days of walking, and they come into the house of God. And Solomon says, when the foreigner comes in and he prays, answer him. Answer him. Because he will hear about your mighty name, your outstretched arm, your power will be manifest. And when you answer him, all the ends of the earth will know about it. And I can imagine that couple coming in and maybe saying, you know, we don't know how to pray. And somebody says, well, all you've got to do is pray. He's a father. And that man gets down and begins to cry out to God, God, heal our child. If you are God, if you are the real God, the living God, if you are the maker of heaven and earth, if you are the one that says as With you, there's no variableness, no shadow of turning. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Call unto me, and I'll answer you. Show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. If you are that sort of a God, then heal our child. And all of a sudden, you know, that baby begins to move its head because its ears are open now, and it can hear. All of a sudden, its eyes begin to track because now its blind eyes are open. Maybe it's got a withered arm, and that arm shoots out straight. Can you imagine when they get back to the village? Do you think they take a big bowl of rice and go to their God and say, thank you? I don't think so. I think they're going to tell everybody, listen, you saw what our baby was like. Look at our baby now. The God of Israel healed our baby. That all the end, you see, that really is the thinking behind this verse. It's one of the most revelatory verses in the Old Testament concerning how this man, with all of his brilliant wisdom that God gave him, considered the house of God to be. Now, that was the Old Covenant. And the Bible says the latter house will what? Be greater. We've got a long way to go. That's the old covenant. 
See, we've got to stop believing that the power of God, that this is God's house. You see, in the New Testament, it was noised abroad, what? That Jesus was in the house. And what was he doing? All of these things. Now, the great missionary book, of course, of the Bible is the book of Jonah. You know the story. This man that has been called by God to go to Nineveh, Nineveh being one of the worst places that you could possibly go to. It was known for its absolute brutality. Historians tell us that they were so barbaric that they would strip people, literally skin people alive, and then drape the human skins on the wall of the city to provoke fear. Don't mess with us. I mean, they were just absolutely the worst possible people that you could think of going to. So don't be too hard on uh, old Jonah when he went in the opposite direction. We may have done the same thing. But uh, the story of Jonah is a true story, obviously. It's not a parable, it's, uh, it's a true story. Jesus vouched for it and uh, said as it was in the days of Jonah. But, uh, but it was also a prophetic message to the nation of Israel. You see, just as Jonah had a mandate from God to go to Nineveh, every Israelite was supposed to be a Jonah. Every Israelite was supposed to let their light shine. Every Israelite had a and Nineveh, if you like, that they were responsible for. They were to be a light to the Gentiles. They were to be a light to the nations of the earth. And God was trying to say, if you like, prophetically through this one individual, listen, if you do not obey me, I can put you in the belly of a whale. You see, God has got various size whales. How many of you know that? We don't know if it was a whale, but you understand. You know, he can make fish uh, big enough to swallow one person. He can make a fish big enough to swallow, you know, a whole church. Or he can make a fish big enough to swallow an entire nation. If you don't believe me, turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. Some of you are looking at me like, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. So... Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 34, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has devoured me. He has crushed me. He has made me an empty vessel. He has swallowed me like a dragon. Other translation says like a monster. He has filled his stomach or his belly with my delicacies. He has cast me away. Other translations say he has washed me away. Now, in other words, Babylon becomes a fish, and Babylon opens its mouth, and one gulp, and the nation of Israel disappears. Why? Because of their disobedience, because of their idolatry and sinfulness, and so on. And so they get swallowed, not for three days and three nights, but what? Seventy years they are in the belly of Babylon. But then notice what happens in verse 44, and I will punish Bel in Babylon, And I will make what he has swallowed, or I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he has swallowed, and the nations shall not flow together any more unto him, yea, the wall of Babylon shall fall. Let me just take the first portion of the verse. And I will punish Bel in Babylon, I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he has swallowed. In other words, just as God can tickle the belly of a whale and get him to regurgitate uh, uh, I'm going to say Noah, but uh, Jonah, God can do the same thing with the nation of Israel. He can bring them out of their bondage, bring them out of their captivity. One of the things that Israel did after coming out of Babylon, of course, they never went back into idolatry. They never quite got with the full purpose of God, but at least some things were cured. And so we've looked at just a few verses. There are many verses, but it gives you an understanding of God's intention for the nation of Israel. They were to be a light to the nations. They were to be a missionary nation. God raised them up with one simple mandate that through you, all the nations of the earth are to be blessed. We now go to the New Testament, and let's go to Matthew chapter 21. Now, I know some of you are telling me that your jigsaw is getting bigger by the minute. And you still don't have the cover of the box, but uh, we'll get there, so bear with me. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 23, just to give you the background. And when he, 
being Jesus, was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority doest thou these things, and who gave you this authority? So Jesus has come into the temple. The temple obviously is the very core, the very center of everything that uh, Israel did revolved around the temple. It was, uh, you know, it was the Houses of Parliament. It was Buckingham Palace. It was, uh, you know, Stormont. It was sort of all rolled into one. It was the temple. Everything revolved around the temple. And in the temple, you have the chief priests and you have the elders of the people. In other words, uh, the powers that be, the spiritual hierarchy of the entire nation is there in the temple and Jesus walks in. And he begins to tell them a parable. Verse 33, here another story, a parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and he hedged it about and he digged a wine press in it and he built a tower and he led it out to husbandmen and he went on a journey. Now, this particular parable is taken from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5. In uh, Psalm 80, I think it's verse 5, you'd have to check it out, but uh, it says, God went into Israel and he removed a vine from Israel, meaning that when the nation of Israel was in bondage to uh, Pharaoh, God eventually set them free, but he likens them to a vine, and he said, I took that vine out of in Egypt, and I transplanted that vine into the promised land. And Isaiah gives us a little bit more detail, so that's what Jesus is talking about here. And then when he puts this vine in the, in the promised land, he puts a wall around it. Now the wall, obviously, a fence is to protect it, but he also puts a tower in it because he's going to watch over it. These are his people. Israel were God's people. And so he is going to protect them, watch over them, but he also digs a wine press because he is expecting fruitfulness. He wants this nation, again, this vine, to produce fruit. And so he waits for a while. It says he went on a journey. Verse 34, and when the time of the fruit drew near, in other words, when the time of the harvest drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took the servants, they beat one, killed another, and stoned another. And again, he sent another group of servants, more than the first or larger than the first, and they did the same to them likewise. But last of all, he sent, to them, sent unto them his son, saying, they will respect or they will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and they cast him out of the vineyard, and they slew him. And when the Lord of the vineyard came, what will he do to those husbandmen? So Jesus here is uh, sort of setting a trap. He was a master storyteller. And he says, there was this man who planted this vineyard, and he put a wall around it, and he put a wine press in it, and he put a tower in it, he watched over it, but he was expecting it to produce fruit. And eventually he left, but he sent his servants and, uh, to look for fruit. And instead of getting fruit, they said, this is the, these are the servants, let's kill them. And so they killed them, one after another. And then he says he sent a larger group of servants than the first group, and they killed all of those. And finally he says, well, I'll send my son. At least they will respect my son. And when they saw the son, they said, this is the heir. Let's get rid of him, and we can have the inheritance for ourselves. Now, what does that mean? Jesus here, in a, in a way, is summarizing a lot of the Old Testament. The servants of the prophets. God sent prophet after prophet to Israel, and the prophet's job was not only to denounce sin, but to also try and get them back to the calling of God, to the purpose of God. That's why Isaiah says, listen, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant? You know, have you lost sight of the value of serving me? Is it too small a thing? I raised you up to be a light to the nations. And so the, uh, the prophet's job was to try and get them back on track. And instead, they stoned every prophet. And God, in his incredible patience, he sent a larger group than the first. He doesn't give up. And they stoned one after another after another. Every prophet virtually that God sent to Israel, you know, they rejected whether they stoned them or rejected them, they did not want to hear the message. Finally, he sends his son. And instead of welcoming the son, they kill him. And then Jesus poses this question, when the Lord of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those 
vine dressers or those husbandmen. And they said to him, verse 41, he will miserably destroy those wicked men, and he will let out the vineyard unto other husbandmen, which will render him the fruit in their season. Now, they are caught up in this story. Jesus is a master storyteller, and they think, boy, if, I, if that was my vineyard, if that was my farm, and I, I, I put my farm out, and I, uh, I sent people to work in the fields, and they never gave me a harvest, and years after, year after year went by, and nobody ever gave me any crops, I know what I would do. I'd fire every single one of them. And I would find somebody that would, you know, farm my farm correctly and give me some sort of increase. And Jesus turns to them and he says, Therefore I say to you, verse 43, the kingdom of God shall be taken away from you and shall be given to a nation, notice, bringing forth the fruit thereof. God says, okay, Israel, time out. I've been patient with you. The years have gone by, the decades have gone by, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years have gone by. I've done everything I possibly can, sent servant after servant after servant. Finally, I sent my son, and you have rejected my will. I'm going to find somebody that will bring forth fruit. You see, God's whole desire is fruitfulness. He's not willing that what? Any should perish. That's the heart of God. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, and He's looking for a people that will partnership with Him, that will say, God, I've got the same burden that you do, because you dwell in me, and I want to catch a vision. And so Israel failed to do that. Now, let's go to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 15. And verse 8, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Now let me just take that little phrase there. One of the reasons that Jesus Christ came was to revalidate or reconfirm the promises made to the fathers. It's an interesting study to look at the reasons that Jesus Christ came. For this reason was the Son of uh, God manifest that he might what? Destroy the works of the devil. That's one of the reasons that Jesus came, to destroy the works of the devil. Another reason he came, of course, was to give his life a ransom for many. But there are various reasons, and one of the reasons that Jesus came was to revalidate or reconfirm or draw attention to the nation of Israel one last time as to God's calling for them. So he came to confirm the promises made to the fathers. What were the, who were the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What were the promises? Through you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. In other words, even though Israel had long since forgotten their calling, God still had it in mind. God still had a purpose. He was still looking for somebody to partnership with him. And then notice what it says from there on, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, rejoice, ye Gentiles. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles. Verse 12 talks about you will reign over the Gentiles. In other words, it's all about the Gentiles. You can translate the word Gentiles, the unsaved. That's basically what it's talking about. In other words, God's longing is for the Gentiles, the nations of the earth, anybody that is not Jewish, God still wanted them to embrace His Son. And so He came one last time to try and convince the nation of Israel to sort of get on board, if you like, with His program. That's why the first part of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, He concentrated on the nation of Israel. In fact, sometimes He seemed to be rather hard with the Gentiles. You know, I'm not called to the dogs and so on and so forth, you know. But what he was doing, he was giving one, see, it says God finally sent his son. And he had one last appeal to the nation of Israel. Come and work with me, basically. Share my burden, share my heart. And yet they stoned him and said, we don't want to have anything to do with it. Now, let's go to Galatians chapter 3 for a moment. Go back to... uh, this passage that we looked at. 
And let's define something a little more clearly. Verse 16, Galatians 3 and verse 16. Now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as referring to many, but to one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Now, here Paul gives us clarity. God said to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. He said it repeatedly, over and over again. And Paul says, he did not say seeds, he says seed. And he says that seed is Christ, that through Christ, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Now, I know some of you are going to go, Phew, that lets me off the hook. Thank God. Well, let's go down to verse 26. For you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For many of you, as have been baptized into Christ, you've put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and you are heirs according to the promise. Let me say that again. If you be Christ, if you profess Jesus Christ as your Savior tonight, the Bible says then you are Abraham's seed. In other words, we are the body of Christ. And if we are the body of Christ, then we are the heirs of the promise. What was the promise? The promise was, I will bless you, I'll make your name great, and so on and so forth. But the ultimate promise was, and through your seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Now we have in America, I'm sure you have it here because of your television and so on, we have an entire movement in America called the Prosperity Movement. And they've got this particular verse down pat. They said, listen, we're of the seed of Abraham. They even have songs. We're of the seed of Abraham and his blessings rest on me. Well, there's a, there's a measure of truth to that. That's what it says here. You are Abraham's seed. You're an heir according to the promise. And part of the promise was, I'll bless you. And those that bless you, I will bless. Those that curse you, I will curse, and so on. But then they stop there most of the time. And the thing about being an heir is you cannot tear up the will. You can't say, let's say your father dies and he's a multimillionaire, but he's also made a few bad investments, but he's still worth millions. And your father dies and it's just you and your brother. And the uh, lawyer takes out the will and he reads it. And uh, it says here, you know, there is now, you know, $10 million coming to you boys. The problem is he uh, made some bad investments and it says here that there's a $3 million debt. And you say to the lawyer, give the $3 million debt to my brother. I'll take all the cash. Now you can't do that. It would be nice if you could. In other words, if you could divide up the will and take the part that is uh, the blessing part and then give the responsibility of the indebtedness to somebody else. But that's what many of them have done in America. They've taken the, the promise to Abraham, and they've taken the blessing, but with the blessing comes responsibility. And through you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. In other words, there is a calling that you cannot opt out of and say, well, I just want, the, I want all the money. I don't want the responsibility. See? We have a responsibility. We are the children of Abraham in that sense. We are heirs of the promise. But the promise, the ultimate promise is that we are to go to the nations of the earth. Let me show you that in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13. Paul came to the realization as a Jew that he had a responsibility. Verse 46. Acts 13 verse 46. And Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. That means they were preaching well. And they said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you have put it from you and judge yourself unworthy of eternal life, we are turning to the Gentiles. For, lo, or for so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee as a light to the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be salvation unto the ends of the earth. Other translations say that thou should bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, Paul says, he's addressing the Jews, and he's saying, 
Barnabas and I, we are turning to the Gentiles because the Lord has commanded not us, meaning Barnabas and Saul, but us, meaning Jews. In other words, he's addressing, one of, he's addressing his own people. God has commanded us to go to the Gentiles, but you have rejected the message. Therefore, Barnabas and I are going to the Gentiles. You see what I'm saying? In other words, it doesn't let me off the hook. You may not obey, but I have to obey, Paul is saying. So Barnabas and I are going to the Gentiles, and it says when the Gentiles heard it, they were glad and began to glorify the Word of God. So Paul understood as a Jew, I have a mandate from God to go to the Gentiles. That's my calling as a Jew. And that's our calling as Jews, he's saying to the crowd. But since you won't listen and you don't want to get involved, Barnabas and I are going to do what God told us to do, but we're going to obey. And so he turns and he goes to the Gentiles. Now, let me begin to put this together. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. This is one of the most fascinating portions of Scripture in the Bible. And I think you will agree with me in a moment when you see it. This is after the resurrection. Jesus is uh, gathered with his disciples. And in verse 45, it says, He opened their understanding that they may understand the Scriptures. Jesus is obviously the world's greatest teacher. Why? Because the Word became flesh. And uh, he opens their minds to understand, to comprehend the Scriptures. We could use the word Bible there. We're not talking about the New Testament because it didn't exist at this time. So we're talking about the entire Old Testament. Jesus is going to open their mind to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, verse 46, thus it is written. In other words, this is what it's all about. Now this is one, like I said, this really is one of the most fascinating passages of, uh, of Scripture in the Bible. Because you have the Son of God, not the Apostle Paul, as great as he was, not John with his great book of Revelation, you know, not Peter with all of his uh, great uh, uh, teaching and so on. You have the Son of God himself explaining the Word of God. Now, how many of you have ever read Reader's Digest magazine? You know, in every Reader's Digest magazine, there is a condensed book. And what they do, they go to, uh, you know, the New York Times best-selling uh, list of books, or maybe you have the equivalent in London or something, and they'll take a very popular book, a book that maybe sold a million copies or something, or five million copies, and maybe that book is 500 pages, and they will reduce it down, and they will give us a Reader's Digest condensed version. And what they do, they sort of spit out all the bones, and they just reduce down the, the essence of the story. So you don't have to wade through 500 pages. You get the story in just, you know, 5 or 10, 15 pages, whatever it is. Now, that's, that's amazing that they can do that. Jesus now is going to take a 1,200 or 1,000 page book, depending what your Bible is like, the entire Old Testament, and he's going to reduce down this 1,000 or 1,200 page book to two verses. To two verses. This is why it is so fascinating. He opens their mind, let's go back to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, This is what it's all about. Thus it is written. And thus it behooved Christ to suffer. Now, this is a little bit Elizabethan the way it says. Other translation says that the Christ was to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. Now, I missed something. Let me go back. Verse 44. He said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. In other words, he's saying, listen, everything in the Bible about me is going to be fulfilled. In the law of Moses, that's the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then you have the Psalms, not just what we call the Psalms, but the poetic book, song, uh, Psalms, uh, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And then you've got all the prophetic books as well. 
In other words, Jesus said, everything in the Bible ultimately is about me. In the volume of the book, it is written of me, Jesus said. And then he opens their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, if you really understand what all the prophets are talking about, what Moses was talking about, and in and all the other writings, if you reduce it down to its very essence, it's about my death, my suffering, my resurrection, and then it's about repentance being proclaimed in my name among all nations beginning in Jerusalem. And then he adds this, and you to the 12 disciples, and you are responsible. You are to be the witnesses. You are to be the announcers, the declarers, the preachers, the proclaimers. And then he says, but, hold on. Tarry, if you like. Behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you have been endued with power from on high. In other words, you cannot do this job by yourself. You need supernatural power. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and what? You shall be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. That's why the Spirit of God was given, in order that we would have the power to accomplish the heart of God, the longing on the heart of God, to go to the nations of the earth. And so Jesus takes the entire Bible here, and reduces it down. Now, you know, you may, some of you may have gone to Bible school and studied Old Testament survey and studied the book of Jeremiah, studied the, you know, the tabernacle of Moses and all of the intricate details or all the feast of Israel or whatever it is. But all of that ultimately spoke about Jesus. He was the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. He was the tabernacle that tabernacled amongst us. He was the high priest, the ultimate high priest. And all of those things in types and shadows, they all spoke about Jesus. But he says, really, this is what it's really about. It's about the seed. It's about the seed. And the seed dying on the cross, and as a result of the death of that seed, repentance and forgiveness of sins being proclaimed to all nations. You want to know what this club is all about? We're to be proclaimers. That's what this club is all about. You have a responsibility to reach the nations of the earth, beginning in Jerusalem, your own backyard, if you like. Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth, that's the longing on the heart of God. He's not willing that any should perish. In fact, in 1 Peter, we find... 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are. Notice he said, I'm going to raise up what? Another nation that will bring forth the fruit. And he says, you now are the royal priesthood. You're the holy nation. You're a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, that you are to proclaim what God has done in your own life, how he took you out of darkness, he took you out of Egypt. That was what God, the nation of Israel was supposed to uh, rejoice about to the nations. Listen, we were in bondage. There was no way we could set ourselves free, but by the blood of the Lamb, we were set free from the cruelty and the oppression of sin and the taskmasters that beat us and held us bound and so on. And they would have proclaimed to the nations, it was our God that delivered us. And we are to do the same thing. God delivered me from alcohol. God delivered me from whatever it is. You know, God put my marriage back together. God healed my body. God did, you know, we are to be proclaimers. And we are that holy nation. He says, in times past, you were not a people. So it's referring to the Gentiles. But now you are the people of God. We should not obtain mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. See, God has a purpose. I could go on. There's many, many other scriptures and different ways that we could uh, look at tonight. But I, I believe that many of the answers that you've prayed, and I am very, very, very much in, f in favor of uh, prayer and prayer for revival. But you know, God can't do it by himself. I know we'd like him to. I know we'd like him to start, start moving out there and people just pour into the house of God and it's not impossible. But God needs laborers. You may have to put feet to your own prayers. Let me say that again. You may have to put some feet to your own prayers. Oh God, rend the heavens and come down. You know. 
And God says, well, would you go and invite your neighbor to come to the meeting? Would you go, would you go and share with your neighbor about Christ? Oh, but Lord, I'm afraid. And God says, listen, you need the power of the Spirit of God. Peter, who was terrified on the day of Pentecost, had incredible boldness. Why? Because the Spirit of God rested upon him. That's why we need the Spirit of God. To give us that Holy Ghost boldness, that confidence. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. And I believe that God is wanting to send a move of the Spirit of God back here to Ireland again as I read and become aware again of all the amazing revivals, the amount of missionaries that went out from these shores over the years to India and other places. And God is looking again for those that will partnership with Him. Those that will say, Lord, here am I. Send me. He may not send you to Africa or India. He may just send you down the street. But you see, that's what this club really is all about. It really is to be a lifeboat. That's what it's to be about. One of the visions in the book of William Booth are people that are drowning in the ocean. And people go out and rescue them. And then they stand on the shore, the ones that have got rescued. And they don't go and hear the cries of others that are still drowning in the ocean. You'd have to read the whole vision. But we're like that, aren't we? We thank God for saving us and rescuing us. We thank God that the lifeboat came along and we've, we're in the lifeboat. But are we prepared to get back in the water and save somebody else that's drowning? That's what this club is all about. That's what the church is all about. And God wants us again to yield ourselves to Him and say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Lord, open doors of opportunity as I begin to pray. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart, as that old song says, and win that soul through me, that I may always do my part to win that soul to Thee. And if you're fearful, then you need the baptism of the Spirit. Lord, give me that Holy Ghost boldness. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. You see, God, I believe, again, is wanting to bring revival. But it's going to take a church and a people that said, Lord, I'm available. I'll do my part. But what if they reject me? What if they... Well, some of them will. Even the Son of God, in the parable of the sower, he sowed seed. And some of that seed was taken by the enemy, even though he was the world's greatest evangelist, if you like. The Son of God himself was sowing the seed. And some of that seed fell on stony ground, the birds of the air came, others withered away. And that will be true of your life and my life if it was true of the Son of God. Not every, everybody will receive, but we should still go. And we can see a harvest, 30, 60, 100 fold. God wants to use again this club for His glory. And He's called us to be laborers together with Him. Let's just close in prayer. Father, I pray tonight that, Lord, you'd once again stir in my own life. Lord, I think of the times I've spent on the streets and the tracks that I passed out over the years. And, Lord, the times I've ministered on the streets. And, Lord, whatever method it may be, I pray for this congregation that, Lord, they would see a mighty, mighty, mighty ingathering. Lord, you said, go into the highways and hedges. Lord, that's a good Irish verse the highways and hedges. There's not a nation on earth that has hedges like Ireland. Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. God, you long for your house to be full. And the fact that the house of God is not full is again an indictment on the people of God that we have not done what you've told us to do. Lord, you want a packed house? You want a full house? God, I ask you, put that burden within us, Lord. Take away the fear of man, Lord. Break that over us. Give us that Holy Ghost boldness. Lord, this nation needs you. Father, we can rescue the perishing. Lord God, make this more than just a motto, Lord, a lifeboat. Father, let it be true. Let each and every one, Lord, know what it is to rescue the souls of men and women. Father, there are people perishing round about us, people committing suicide. Young people taking drugs, looking for answers. Father, we pray, God, that you'd use us just to reach out, put our arms around somebody, pray for somebody, give them a tract, invite them to church, bring them home for a meal, whatever it is, Lord, whatever method. 
Father, we ask, God, that you would soften our hearts. Lord, let us weep as you wept over Jerusalem. Lord, we believe you still weep over Ireland and over other nations. And yet, Lord, you look for our eyes to weep through. Father, we ask that, God, you would begin to revive this land once again. Let it once again know what it is to be a great missionary nation, Lord, sending out missionaries. Father, a nation of prosperity, Lord, not just so we can drive around in great big fancy cars and have beautiful homes, but, Lord, prosperous so that we can, uh, Lord, take the gospel and support those that have gone out, Lord. Lord, that they would have an abundance. And so, Father, bless, we pray, that we might be a blessing. I'm going to give you a minute just to respond tonight. You don't have to come forward, but God sees your heart. Just voice a prayer to Him. Does it have to be an audible prayer? God hears your cry. If it's fear, then say, God, take away the fear of man. God, fill me with your Spirit. God, give me again a burden for a lost and a dying world. Lord, I want to serve the purpose of God like David in my generation. Before I die, Lord, give me a soul Give me two or three or four. Make me an instrument, Lord, a blessing to others. Whatever that prayer is, Lord, just, uh, uh, just verbalize it now to the Lord. Make yourself available. Ask Him to open doors before you, opportunities over the course of the next week and month and year that, Lord, uh, the Lord would lead you. You'd meet somebody you haven't seen for maybe a number of weeks or months. Maybe just go up to them and say, how are you doing? Father, we pray for divine appointments for your people. Lord, arrange those things that, Lord, no man can arrange for the glory of God.